Hello, everybody, and thank you for coming at this 8 a.m. time. Oh, the podium, podium is on. Uh, on what seems like the sixth day of the conference, I know it's only the, only the third day. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the society, and we're going to uh, announce and hand out some awards to start out. Um, I really think our society does a lot of great things, as all four societies here do. Uh, certainly our, our journal, the American Naturalist, these meetings, um, our standalone meetings, which are coming up in January. And I just want to say the registration starts Thursday, opens Thursday for this LMR, and uh, symposium proposals are due on the 11th, and so please, if you have a uh, proposal, uh, please get that in. Um, and we. For those of you that haven't been to a Silmar, it's like the old days of this meeting that most of you don't remember. A few of you do. Um, small. We all eat together. Uh, there, there's a lot more uh, uh, opportunity for interactions. It, it's a great meeting. Um, we support uh, other things like reg um, several regional meetings every year, early career travel, um, and our diversity committee initiatives, which I'm super excited about. Um, but what I'm going to do now is the awards, and, and I think that really belongs on this list because it allows us to recognize the contributions of the senior people in our field and also boost early career researchers. And I, I have to thank the awards committees. All but one of these awards is uh, chosen by separate committees for each award. Uh, it's a lot of work. Uh, they did a very careful job, and, and I think you'll be pleased with the results, as pleased as I am. Um, now, what we've continued for the second year now and refined a little bit, uh, working with a, our diversity committee, um, we have vetting for, for code of uh, ethics violations for our officers and for our awardees. And, and you know, we know that's really important. We really need to uh, make sure people who are getting these awards and serving uh, as officers share our values. And this is the Tri Society uh, Code of Ethics. Um, and, and even more importantly, in some ways, I think, than that, is that the Diversity Committee is working on revising our awards criteria to be uh, kind of more proactive. And let's, let's really recognize people who are doing good things. We hate the vetting because that's, uh, you know, people that maybe have done bad things. We want to recognize people that are really proactively doing good things, uh, contributions to our field beyond just research. Now, these are still going to focus on research. I'm not saying these aren't, aren't heavily research-based awards, but we want to broaden that out uh, to recognize more contributions. And please get involved. Um, so uh, President-elect Dan Bolnick uh, is already started on, on appointing new members to, to our committees. And uh, uh, I said before it was a lot of work, didn't I? I shouldn't have said that. It's not bad. <laughs> Some of the words actually aren't that bad, I don't think. But uh, anyway, and then also the graduate council as well. Uh, Dan doesn't do that. They, they uh, appoint their own uh, members. Okay, so I'll just jump right into the awards. Um, the ASN Award for Distinguished Achievement in the Conceptual Unification of the Biological Sciences goes to Anurag Agrawal. And this award honors a senior but still active investigator who is making fundamental contributions to the society's goals, namely promoting uh, the conceptual unification of the biological sciences. And that's what ASN is all about. Um, and from the awards committee statement, Dr. Agarwal's research exemplifies this in its integration of evolution, genetics, ecology, and behavior in investigating the milkweed village, the guild of insects that consume milkweeds, along with the milkweeds that host themselves. And I'm sorry to say that Anurag couldn't make it, but please join me in giving him a round of applause. Next up, uh, the ASN Distinguished Naturalist Award goes to Rachel Page. Um, and this award is given to an active investigator in mid-career who has made significant contributions to the knowledge of a particular ecosystem or group of organisms. Individuals whose research and writing illuminate principles of evolutionary biology and enhanced aesthetic appreciation of natural history merit special consideration. And the committee chose Rachel Page for her work using emerging techniques to investigate how 
uh, <laughs> how animals use sensory and cognitive tools to perceive the world around them, particularly her key contributions to bat sensory ecology. She's also an inspirational communicator, does stellar work in promoting diversity and equity, and is a respected mentor, mentor to young scientists. And again, Rachel couldn't be with us today, but please let's give her a round of applause. Um, so th this is the one award that's not chosen by a committee, it's chosen by the president. Uh, I will say that my lab uh, helped me out a little bit with, with ranking finalists. Um, and so the ASN Presidential Award for, I'll just say, the paper I liked best in AMNAT last year uh, uh, goes to Hillary Metz, Alexandria Miller, Alexandra Miller, Janet Yu, Julina Acorli, Frank Avila, Eva Buchner, Buckner, probably, Philomena Kane, Samson Otu, Alangat Panlawat, Omar Triana Chavez, Katie F. Williams, and Carolyn McBride for their paper, Evolution of a Mosquito's Hatching Behavior to Match Its Human-Provided Habitat. And, and I thought this paper really exemplified, again, the, the main goal of, of ASN, uh, the conceptual unification of biology with results of both fundamental and applied importance they combine wide, geographically widespread field sampling with rigorous field and lab experiments um, to show that a subspecies of the yellow fever mosquito has recently evolved to be locally adapted to the water containers made by humans in, in urban uh, habitats instead of their ancestral tree hole habitat. And the paper also has a very diverse set of authors, including several undergraduates and collaborators really from across the global South, Africa, Asia, and South America. And again, none of them could make it here to receive the award, so let's give them a round of applause. The other paper award is the American Naturalist Student Paper Award. Uh, and this is notable because it's chosen by the editors of MNAT, and of course they know uh, these papers better than certainly I do. Um, and that goes to Gregor Foster Sigmund, Dave Muller, Vince Eckert, and Monica Gaber, but mainly to, to Gregor Fausto as the student. Bed hedging is not sufficient to explain germination patterns of a winter annual plant. And the, the editors, among other things, said, this paper is a perfect example of integrating long-term data, experimental work, and theoretical modeling to change the way people think about a classic uh, question and system. And I don't know if I should be taking this personally or not, but uh, Gregor Fausto also couldn't uh, join us today. So once again, let's give him a round of applause. And I don't want to forget uh, the honorable mention, which I need my glasses for smaller font. Uh, oh, no, it's down there. Noah Simon Baruch, Haupt, and Reese Kassen on the de novo emergence of ecological interactions during evolutionary diversification, a conceptual framework and experimental test. So another round of applause, please. Uh, now we have the, uh, I think one of my favorites, the ASN Early Career Investigator Awards. I'm going to ask them to come on up if they're here. Um, please, any of them are here? Yes, some of them are here. Okay. Um, Stephanie Aguilon, Kyle David, Valentina Gomez Bahamon, Chloe Schmidt, and Sheila Turbeck. And uh, I, I gave them their fancy plaques yesterday at the symposium. Um, and if you miss that symposium, you should have serious mofo, uh, FOMO, f FOMO. <laughs> I always get those con confused. It was an incredible symposium. You really missed it. Um, and so here they are, uh, our wonderful young, uh, sorry, early career investigators. And let's give them a round of applause. Should I shake off? Great, thank you. OK, 
Okay, last but certainly not least is the Student Poster Award, and this is uh, for the posters that were held just uh, on Saturday night, and, and our uh, committee did a great job of uh, choosing winners and honorable mentions in a short amount of time, and we have uh, fancy certificates um, that were degraded by having my signature on them. Um, that's fine. Um, so the winner was Phoebe Cunningham. Phoebe, if you're here, please come on up. Um, from Queen Mary. Yeah, yes. I'll go ahead and give you your certificate. Pretty nice. Thank you. Now, hang on. Um, so, uh, for, with, oh, I didn't read your title, Roles and Regulations. I like that. I started to read it wrong, but for the first time I looked at it. Nutrient provision and host regulation of symbionts in three distinct lineages of ants. And the judges were impressed by the natural history, the quality and depth of the work presented, and the clean visual style of presentation. So again, congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we have two honorable mentions. Uh, Stephen Casey from the University of Massachusetts Lowell. Come on up, Stephen, if you're here. And I'll, let's bring up both. Uh, and uh, Sophia Hasek Cox from Stanford. Sophia? Yes, I think. Okay, cool. Okay, we can go ahead and applaud now. So Stephen's poster, Dragline Silk Gene Expansion in Triangle Weaver Spiders accompanies exceptionally proline rich fibers in spring loaded webs, which sounds pretty cool. And the judges cited the interesting results, I guess they thought so too, and the presenter's enthusiasm and depth of knowledge. And Sophia's, uh, the genetic basis and development of a novel tail spot pattern in Zephophorus varietus. Um, and the judges were impressed with the results and the strong potential of the work, especially as an example of undergraduate research. And in the early career symposium, we saw a picture, I think, of Sophia, and I heard she's looking for graduate school, maybe. Um, and so, okay. Thank you. Okay, fun stuff's over. So here's my title. Um, uh, Patterns of Phenotypic Variation. I, I'm, I'll t I really want to focus on phenotype as I have for my whole career. Um, and heritability and correlations are less important than we think. I realize that's probably not the best title. The best title is probably this that they're less important than I spent my entire career thinking that they were. And so in some cases, this is me expressing my disappointment. Uh, that's not quite true, but uh, learning some things I thought were important or not. But uh, So this kind of looks like your standard biodiversity slide, and it is that. But I'm really focusing here on the phenotypic adaptations of these, these creatures. Let me see if I can point. I can point. So. Uh, Jellyfish, uh, mantle, tentacles, I don't know anything about jellyfish, but I'm sure those things are all adaptations. Uh, um, I, act I actually am pretty sure. Uh, we can talk about my, sometimes I call myself doc Dr. Pangloss, and I think I am. Um, that the cuttlefish, tentacles, you know, uh, con eyes convergent with vertebrates, they color change, that's pretty cool. Uh, the duck-billed platypus. <laughs> it's a duck-billed <laughs> platypus. I mean, we're, it's insane, and those things have to be adaptations. I'm just saying. 
just saying. Uh, these orchids that, that mimic uh, bees, and, and male bees are stupid enough, as males are, to come and mate with this uh, flower and, and transfer pollen without getting any reward. And then, then these are the fungus beetles that, that I worked on for my, my thesis, and, and Butch Brody and Vince Formica and others have, have uh, continued, expanded that, that work a lot. Um, and the many adaptations here, I first was interested in the horns and the males, but, but the females have this incredible uh, trapdoor uh, at the end of their abdomen. It's the, it's the seventh abdominal tergite, and females have complete control over mating here. So this male is, yes, trying, uh, and in most cases, the female just leaves that trapdoor closed and he's out of luck. Uh, and, and again, the dumb males, I have a picture of a male trying to mate with a dead female, and I'm sure that didn't work at all. So, uh, so I, I think adaptations also exemplify the conceptual unification of biology uh, that, that we focus on at the American Society of Naturalists. Uh, there's no biodiversity without adaptation, because without adaptations, uh, all species would be extinct. Uh, and of course, it's not a trivial problem at all because the vast, vast, almost all species that have ever existed on Earth are extinct, uh, and that's essentially a failure of adaptation in some sense. Um, and I define adaptations as phenotypes that function, and that's important, that's the first F-bomb I'll drop today, function to deal with an environmental challenge or opportunity. It has to have a job to do to be an adaptation. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about generalizations, principles, and patterns. Um, so two years ago, at this address, Judy Bronstein said that humans like to po type t topologies, uh, but this impedes understanding. And, and Ernst Meyer, some years before that, had, had warned against what he called typological thinking. Um, last year in this address, Maria Cividio, uh, one of her main points was that generalizations are generally wrong, uh, but, but some are useful. And so uh, on Saturday, and I didn't talk to David about this, and I don't know if he's here or not, but my take on David's uh, talk was that species can't really be defined. Uh, and then I put in, I don't think he said this, I would say due to continuous variation. And that's one of my main themes today uh, is that uh, it's hard to categorize biological variation. And so uh, what I'll say is, I agree with Judy, and, and I'll also show that uh, some evidence that suggests that some widely held generalizations are wrong or at least misleading. So agreeing with Maria, I know pretty much I have just different examples in some cases. But, but my title says patterns, uh, and I'll also talk about things I'm sort of calling principles. Well, they aren't different from generalizations, so am I saying mine are right and other people's are wrong? I, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm old enough to be okay with that, um, but we can have a discussion afterwards. So here, here's my main points. Um, all traits are affected, but not determined by genes and the environment. And so at least at the most basic level, this whole nature-nurture uh, idea is meaningless, and I can use stronger words if you want. Um, and then a subset of that is heritability isn't as important as we think it is. It is important but we've put a lot of other meaning on heritability, uh, and that's bled out into the general public, and I think that's not a good idea. Um, and I alluded to this earlier, phenotypic variation is difficult or impossible to categorize, and there's two main reasons that I see that there's overlapping continuous variation in most traits among whatever categories we might choose to put uh, organisms in, so defining a group or category doesn't predict a trait well for any members of those categories. And uh, also, this might be surprising to some folks. Some of this stuff is not surprising. Some of these things you, people are saying, duh, why is he bothering to say this in a presidential address? Others might make people unhappy, but, but again, we can talk. Um, the average correlation among traits is not very high. Um, so knowing one trait in an organism doesn't predict other traits in that individual very well at all. And, and then the geeky stuff, which I might run out of time for, we'll see, uh, is that correlational selection might not be very common, uh, and evolution might not be strongly constrained by the G matrix, the genetic variances and covariances of, of quantitative genetics. Okay, 
So my first point, I don't really have data on this. It's an argument. Um, but, but here's my argument. All traits arise directly or indirectly from instructions in genes and information and materials from the environment. You can't make a trait without those two things. Um, so some of this material in this talk is from my, uh, I, I use in my graduate evolution class at Michigan State University, which I haven't taught quite as long as Ruth has, but if you add my class, similar class at the University of Illinois, I'm, I'm getting pretty, pretty close. Um, and I was thinking at the poster session the other night that uh, there are probably at least a dozen alumni of my class here at these meetings, which I find pretty gratifying. Probably none of them are actually here, though. But anyway, uh, so I often pose this uh, question to the students, and, and I have them do the think pair share, go off and talk among each other and re report back. Can we think of any traits that are not affected by the environment? And, and what they often come back with invariant, is invariant traits. And this is a great focus on variation, and that's the better way I'll, I'll get to this, uh, to think about these problems, is sources of variation. But you can't, again, you can't make a trait without something from the environment directly or indirectly. And then conversely, can we think of traits that are not affected by genes? And often behavior, culture, that kind of stuff comes up. But again, these things come from nervous systems, which again need materials from the environment to, to build. So that's my argument. I, I, I love to talk about things like this, so if people disagree, I, I, I'd love to hear about it. And so anyway, if you do accept this, then again, at the most basic level, nature-nurture is meaningless. Uh, we can still talk about sources of variation and, and very meaningfully, uh, but not this business of genetic traits versus not genetic traits. Okay, so I shouldn't even do this slide. I mean, from this title, you know this was going to be an annoying slide. Um, and I put the cuttlefish because he kind of looks curmudgeonly, doesn't he? It did, did to me. Um, so I'll, I'll just kind of zip through this. And I want to start by saying, and there's even a bullet point coming up, I'm not trying to criticize anybody's work here. Uh, uh, some of the, this is mainly terms that I think aren't well defined and maybe we should think twice before we use them. And some of these terms uh, have been, I've heard a lot at these meetings already in great talks. Uh, uh, so I'm not trying to, again, criticize people's work. I'm trying to uh, get us to think, well, words matter. Think carefully about how we use our words. Because science is hard and evolution is really hard. I think, uh, and so it's important what words we choose. Genetically based trait. So I don't know what that means. Um, and, and pretty often when students in my class or in my lab it would say something, I'll say this. I, I don't know what this means. And I'm pretty sure this is one of my most endearing traits. Um, but I think it's important uh, because cause I don't. Now, if someone has a definition of this, great define it the first time you use it, and, and then, then I'm super happy with it. But I don't usually hear people try to define it. I think it's just this shorthand we've fallen into that is pretty big. Hardwired trait, I hear that less. Don't know what it means. I don't think we have wires. Um, biological basis for a trait or a biologically based trait. I, sometimes I think it's a shorthand for genetically based. Um, all organizational traits are biologically based. And so, again, I don't, I don't think that's a useful thing to say. And, and this is what I said before. It just We hinder our understanding if we're using terms that we can't clearly define or, or that we don't clearly define. As long as we clearly define them, we're, we should be good. And I, I said this before. I, I'm not trying to be a jerk here. Um, but you can take it that way if you prefer. Um, and so, again, I alluded to this, the, the, the better path forward, and I'll come back to this, is focus on phenotypic and gen genetic variation within populations and mean genetic differences among populations. And you can scale this up to uh, among species as well, as David was talking about. I, I, that's beyond my pay grade. I, I stay within my single species lane and usually single population lane. So I want to step back a little bit and talk about phenotypic evolution. And in my class, I refer to this equation as the Rosetta Stone of quantitative genetics. I think it's kind of the Rosetta Stone of, of adaptation. Um, not that it explains all of adaptation, but it, it gives an incredibly useful framework to, for understanding this. And this is the multivariate version of maybe the more uh, familiar breeder's equation, R equals H squared S. In both cases, the kind of 
dependent variable uh, is, is change in mean across one generation for a trait. So this is delta Z bar. This is in a matrix equation, so this is a column of numbers, and the number of numbers in the column is how many traits you're considering at once. And, and this is important, and this is why it's so much more useful in the breeder's equation for evolutionary biologists, is breeders can be selecting on one trait at a time. In, in nature, uh, selection doesn't just happen on one trait at a time, so we need to consider a set of traits. Um, and so the rate of evolution, change in phenotypic mean, that is the rate of phenotypic evolution, is a product of the G matrix, the genetic, additive genetic variances and covariances uh, for those traits. Um, and the betas, the, the um, selection gradients. So this is a, G is a matrix, a square matrix with a number of rows and columns uh, equal to the number of traits you're considering, and beta is another column vector, just a list of strength of selection. And importantly, beta is corrected for indirect selection due to phenotypic correlations among traits at least the ones that you have included in the model. And that's really important because that indirect selection within a generation caused by phenotypic correlations is, I think, just flat misleading. And it's very important to have as many traits in the model that you think might be under selection and correlated so you can uh, get rid of that source of confusion. OK, I said that. Um, <laughs> Again, I'm not trying to make people mad here. I've spent a lot of time with the G matrix over my career. I think and it's fundamentally important. This equation, fundamentally important. But I think we might have paid maybe a little too much attention on G and not as much attention on selection as I would like. And partly, I think we've done a pretty crappy job of estimating beta there are a number of reasons, but mainly incomplete fitness measures. We're really bad at, at measuring total lifetime offspring production. And we're even worse at, at estimating the gamma term, which isn't even in this equation at all. And I don't, but anyway, uh, that's stabilizing disruptive and correlational selection. And some of this is just a power issue. You, you, you have to add all these terms to your model. You need a bigger sample size. And a lot of people just don't have that sample size. So it's... Uh, an issue. So I first want to talk about uh, G and, and the diagonal, as I said, is the additive genetic variance. And, and, and now we want to talk about the heritability, which is a standardized V sub A. The problem with variances is they depend on the scale of measurement, the units of measurement. And so you can't compare them to each other for different traits or different species or populations without standardizing them. And so, so here it's standardized by the variance, the total phenotypic variance. Um, and so it varies between zero and one. And so uh, heritability isn't as important as we think it is. I need to hide that somewhere else. <clears throat> so again, genetic variation for phenotypic traits within populations is necessary for trait evolution, including adaptation. So it's foundational. I'm not saying it's not important. But it's not. Um, it's not a magic number. Uh, each of these are specific to each trait in each population and each environment. So you can't talk about a heritability of a trait in a species um, because there are a number of heritabilities for the same trait in a species. And all, all, V sub A is affected by the environment and by allele frequencies. And so here, this is a theoretical equation for V sub A. And don't ask me to explain where it came from. but. Um, the allele frequencies are in there, right? So if you have different populations with different differentiated populations with different allele frequencies, V sub A will be different. And, and A and D reflect gene expression. The A is the additive effect. So how much does replacing one allele change the, with another change the, the, the trait expression? And, and D is the, uh, similarly reflects the effect of dominance on trait expression. Another important thing to say here is that heritability, the G matrix, it's all trait specific. It all starts at the trait. And, and, and again, so other traits have, have different V sub A and different heritabilities. So what these tell us is how fast can this trait evolve in this population and this environment, OK? That's important. <laughs> it's important to know that. But that's it. And, and uh, as I'll talk about, we, we put a lot of other uh, weight on heritability that I think is, is um, inappropriate. 
And first, I'll digress a little bit. Heritability itself, because it's a ratio, because it's variance standardized, can be pretty misleading. Um, so I just said that. So, so V sub E, and the main reason it's misleading is V sub E is in the denominator. So, so here I've broken down the total phenotypic variance into, here's the additive variance again, the variance due to dominance and epistatic effects, and, and some people will tell you, I think the evidence still suggests that these tend to be small in natural populations, but not always, and, and this can be true that even if there's lots of dominance and epistasis, there isn't, in gene action, there isn't necessarily a lot of variance in the phenotype caused by those. So, so the big thing I think here generally misleading us is that V sub E, the environmental variance. And so this is, this is microenvironment, microenvironmental variance within the habitat of one population that's causing the differences in, in trait expression among individuals. Um, and, and I like to separate this pretty cleanly from phenotypic plasticity in different environments, and it doesn't separate cleanly because I just made categories and that doesn't work in biology, but um, uh, it, it's important to think of this, and some people call this environmental noise. Again, I don't love noise in this case uh, because it's not really random. I think that's how the physicists use noise. It's how the, how the environment is affecting trait expression in these different in, uh, individuals. So, so I want to talk a little bit about this paper by Leschke Crook. Uh, we saw her on the screen yesterday because she was one of Anne's, Anne Charmentier's uh, uh, advisors, and sorry if Anne's here for the pronunciation of her last name. Um, uh, and they asked this question of, do traits more closely related to fitness have more or less additive variance? And, and so there's two hypotheses. Oh, in red deer. I hope that's a red deer. I took it from the internet. It's a little reddish, but it's impressive anyway. Um, so one hypothesis is that there's less additive variance due to stronger selection depleting variance, and, and selection, directional and stabilizing selection deplete variance, and, and uh, so closely related to fitness, it should be mainly directional selection. And, and uh, Falconer raised this in, in his book, uh, and, and Mousseau and Tim Mousseau and Derek Roth uh, did a, a meta-analysis, uh, well, a, a review paper with a big data set. Um, in 1987, they were, I don't know which way I'm pointing, they were just down the road at McGill uh, when they did this work. Um, or the alternative hypothesis, non-mutually exclusive, is that there's more variance for traits closely related to fitness because they tend to be life history traits and fitness components that are affected by more genes because there's more underlying physiological and morphological traits contributing to those, uh, to those life history and fitness component traits. Uh, more genes and thus more mutations per trait, more targets uh, for mutation to act. Okay, so uh, first they looked at, um, can you see that? It's a, eh, if you're in the back, you might not be able to see that. Um, so, so they just plotted heritability here versus the correlation with total fitness, and each point is a trait. Okay, so they had trait correlations with total fitness sort of like a selection differential, um, pretty, probably pretty closely related to that. Um, and, and so they just plotted these two, and, and they plotted males and females separately. The males are the filled symbols, the females open symbols, and then, then uh, circles are life history traits, and squares are morphological traits. But I think it's better to just focus on the correlation with total fitness, because again, that's categorizing these traits, and they bleed over a little bit. Well, for sure, the life history traits have the lowest uh, heritabilities, and, and many, mostly morphological traits, have a lot higher heritabilities, and they're less closely correlated with fitness. So using heritability as the measure, this looks like Falconer and, and Mousseau and Rolf, Rolf's selection is depleting additive genetic variants. Um, and yes, uh, so this match is actually Gustafson in, in AMNAT. I'm, folk, I'm highlighting AMNAT papers during my talk. Uh, collared flycatchers, and, um, and then after that, Musso and Roth had their big database and found, again, this same pattern of lower heritability uh, with more close, traits more closely related to fitness. Okay, but we can also use the David Hull's additive genetic uh, uh, coefficient of additive, additive genetic variation. So 
the heritability is variance standardized. This is mean standardized, and we have to standardize somehow due to different scales and measurement, but we can also do that with a mean. And so he's basically just dividing uh, the, the additive variance by the mean, and this is just the same formula as for coefficient of variation, a regular uh, phenotypic one, um, but this is additive genetic variance. Um, and there's been lots of discussion on and off over the years about which is better variance or mean standardization. I think in this example, it looks like David might be right, uh, David Houle, that this might work better. And so here's the relationship that they plot. So now instead of heritability on the, the y-axis, it's, it's coefficient of additive genetic variation. Again, the same exact, all three of these plot, I'll show you the trait correlation with fitness. And, and now we see there's no relationship at all. There's, there's a weekly, marginally significant 1.08 for males, but it's actually positive, but there's a negative, non-significant relationship for females. If you put it all together, th there's just no relationship at all. Well, why should that be true? The last thing they looked at was the residual variance, CVR. And, and so they used pedigree-based uh, um, um, measures of, of quantitative genetics, exactly the, the methods that, that Anne talked about yesterday. She was trained uh, by Leschke Cook. Um, and the CVR is mainly uh, environmental variance. There's some other stuff in there too, but it's mainly V sub E. And here what we see is a strong positive relationship in both males and females. Okay, So if you have a trait more closely related to fitness, it has a lot higher V sub B. Okay. And, and this was predicted uh, theoretically by Price and Schluter in, in 1991, exactly this, that life history traits more closely related to fitness should have more environmental variance uh, than morphology. And so here's what I think is going on here. So I made a little toy path diagram just with the correlations among all these traits. So the top part of this graph, CVA, and I'm just presuming <laughs> V sub A here, um, is, is not correlated with fitness nor is it correlated with heritability, and I hadn't, I hadn't, hadn't shown you that before. Um, so, so this top bar says, well, there is no relationship with, it, with either, with heritability or with the trait correlation with fitness, and, and this is the graph I showed. The bottom part, oh, there's too many words there. Um, so this negative relationship here, the first graph I showed you, and, and the other people had shown, uh, Musso, and, Musso and Roth and, and Gustafson, this negative relationship, I think, is really being driven by this path here, that there's a very strong positive correlation between trait correlation with fitness and CVR. That was the last figure I showed you. And then this very strong negative correlation between C CVR and heritability. And that's because CVR is mainly V sub B. It's in the denominator of heritability. And so that relationship with heritability and, and between heritability and fitness is being driven by the denominator of heritability not the numerator V sub A, which is what we're really interested in here. So uh, that's where I think uh, we can be very misled. Um, so to me, this is the relationship that, that probably is right. And maybe both hypotheses are correct and they cancel out. And we've, we've literally got mutation selection balance here. There's stronger selection if you're more closely related to fitness, but there's more mutational input because of more gene loci. Okay, this slide comes almost entirely from, from my class. Sorry if I'm teaching a graduate class here. But I think these things are important. <coughs> okay, so again, I have the question answer thing and you can think about it a little bit um, that I use with my class. If a trait's not heritable, uh, that means V sub A, the numerator is zero. Does that mean it's not a real trait or somehow not adaptive? And I hear people say things like this. Uh, no, because in fact, past selection could have eliminated variation. Okay, exactly what M Musso and Rolf and, and uh, uh, Gustafson argued. Now again, I think that may have been driven by the denominator, but it's still certainly true that strong directional selection or stabilizing selection will uh, eliminate uh, variance. And so just because a trait doesn't isn't have additive variance doesn't, it could mean it is adaptive. I wouldn't go there either, actually. Um, <laughs> if heritability is zero, does that mean it's not affected by genes? 
No, it just means that there's no additive variation in this population and this environment. And, and here's another key. It's not the, heritability is not the same thing as inheritance. And, and, and I've seen this in places that should know better, um, th that conflating those two things. Um, it just means there's no variation, no additive variation uh, for the trait. And again, that's uh, environment specific, population specific. What about heritability of one? Does that mean the trait's not affected by the environment? And, and my students get this too, that it, it says misconceptions up there. So the answer is always no. Um, but, but what's interesting is, I mean, what heritability of one is that, that microenvironmental variance within this environment at this time doesn't contribute to, to phenotypic variance. So V sub E is zero. But again, the environment had input to these traits. These traits couldn't have been made without the environment. Okay. So, again, I, I'll reiterate that V sub A inheritability to determine how fast evolution will be in response to a given strength of selection, super important, <laughs> foundational. Uh, but but that's, a, that's it. And maybe some of you are saying, well, what about resemblance of, uh, among relatives? And that's true. I'm saying on average, and we'll see what I mean in a minute. Indeed, this is how we do quantitative genetics, right? We look at phenotypes on individuals of known genetic relationship. And that can be parent offspring regression, it can be half sib design, it can be pedigrees, it can be uh, genomic relatedness matrices, lots of different ways to get the relatedness, and then we measure traits. So the, the whole quantitative genetics wouldn't work uh, without um, uh, V sub A having to do with resemblance among relatives. However, again, only within one population and one environment, and I think importantly, trait specific, and I made a dumb example, but we say this all the time, right? You know, they have mom's eyes and unfortunately dad's smile. Um, so the slope of the offspring, I'm gonna use offspring parent regression here because it's the simplest way to look at heritability and I think it really illustrates the point, but it's, it's true for any, any estimation method. What I'm gonna say here, so that's the slope, the slope is heritability, but there's always scatter about that slope. That's the R squared. Um, and that tells you how much you can predict any one family from parents. Um, so, so here's an example. This is real data from some floral traits in, in wild radish. Uh, that, again, that's too small. Um, this is anther separation. We can talk about it later. Maybe it'll come up if I have time, but um, so, I picked this trait, to, so, so we just have the offspring means, and these we grew three or four individuals from each family, uh, and then the mean of the two parents. And this is a standard offspring parent regression, so uh, 0.45 is the slope, and that's the average heritability for a morphological trait from that Mousseau and Roth uh, um, uh, compilation. Uh, and, and other kinds of traits actually have lower heritability. So I, I, I picked an, an average trait for the group of traits that have high heritability. Um, but here's the R squared. And so that means that only 26% of the mean of the offspring can be predicted by the, the mean of the parents. Okay, so we don't have a much predictive power here. And then sometimes we think, well, heritability, you know, a highly heritable trait, if you look at the parents, you'll know the value of individuals. So here's what, I, what I've done here is exact same data. I just plotted each individual, separated it out. This is not what you should do, and the statistics are wrong because they're not independent, those, those three or four points. So there's little lines of three or four points that line up with each of these family means. The slope is the same. It looks like it's not because there's one individual with a crazy big uh, outlier value. Um, but the R squared goes down to, to 11%. And so that's what we can know for an average trait in a, in a kind of trait that has high heritability, the highest heritability among different types of traits. Uh, we basically can't predict the value of any trait for, for a trait um, knowing both parents' value for that trait, okay? And I think we think we can with heritability. And even if the heritability was one, that's not genetic determinism because there's still going to be scattered around that, plate, uh, around that line. So there's still going to be a lower ability to predict individual trait values um, from that heritability. What it does mean is if there's selection on that trait, it will, uh, the, the trait can change quite quickly. 
And so I conclude from this that genes in the environment affect all traits, but neither determine them in any meaningful way. And I think that's an important message that often gets lost. Okay, so back to my, uh, well, I am going slowly. We'll skip all the dweeby stuff at the end. All right, um, back to our, uh, my outline, and, and I just told you that, and I also added heritability is an important and it also can be misleading because of visa B in the, in the denominator. Okay, phenotypic variation, difficult or impossible to categorize because of overlapping continuous variation. Um, so my argument is that you can have traits that differ significantly in means between two categories that you put, uh, but there still can be substantial overlap. So this is tribolium flower beetles, and I know Mike Wade's in the audience, so I shouldn't say this, but I, these are my data. I worked on them too. And tribolium is a species that kind of makes beetles seem boring, which is a hard thing to do because beetles are awesome. But, but Mike and others have done a lot of great work on this species, so I shouldn't have said that. But uh, they're real biological organisms, and we can learn things. They're just kind of boring, I think. So, so here we see that, that females are larger in males in, in tribolium, but that the, the male distribution is entirely contained within the female distribution. So knowing whether a, a beetle is male or female doesn't really tell you anything about their, their uh, dry weight. Now, uh, if I have time, I don't think I will. Uh, I'll, I'll briefly show you a picture of my, my uh, graduate student, Jimmy Bingman, and I'll definitely point you to his talk tomorrow because I'm not gonna have time to talk about it. Um, he's been uh, expanding this database uh, that my lab created a long time ago, uh, well, 10 years ago or so, but, and, and one of the sources of data he's using is the National, U.S. National Institutes of Health, All of Us, uh, project, and this is similar to the UK Biobank, and, and there's another one in Iceland, the name I, I don't know, where individuals are being followed over time, lots of measurements being taken, and, and genome sequencing being done, and it's a pretty big one. I don't know why there are a lot more females than males, but I'm, I'm okay with that, um, given the history of research uh, and gender balance. Um, and so I just want to show you a few things that, that we picked out from there. So, uh, and, and what we have for categorization uh, in this database is sex at birth. So I'm gonna say male and female, and I'm referring to sex at birth. Height, well, oh sure, males are on average taller than females, and there are, the ends of the distribution, there are males that are taller than any females and, and, and females that are shorter than any males but there's a ton of overlap in here. And again, we know this. We know there are women that are taller than, than men, but I think we don't think enough about this overlap. And the same thing is tr true with, uh, with weight. And this is like the tribolium, uh, where the male distribution is pretty much entirely contained in the female distribution. Now, this isn't dry weight as we did in the beetles. You know, fortunately, um, Happy to report that. Um, th then th there, there's, there's sex hormones. So this is estradiol. Uh, and the amazing thing to me is, again, the male distribution is entirely contained with the female distribution. And the means aren't that different because there's, you, it's hard to see, but there's a long tail of males. Now, it seems like there are way fewer males, obviously, measured for estradiol. There could be biases. It could be that males were measured because they had some condition that suggested estradiol should be measured, I, I'm not sure, but um, it, it's just not a very big difference, uh, surprisingly different. And so then let's talk about uh, testosterone, which is one of my least favorite uh, hormones. Uh, but so here, yes, there's a giant uh, uh, difference. Uh, I, but, but again, look at the incredible variation among males. And there's really quite a, a lot of overlap. Here it's, it's switched, where the entire female distribution is contained uh, within the male distribution. Uh, so I should, I'm gonna say two things. Well, I'll say about this. So if you say, uh, I don't know, let's say you wanted to, make a testosterone level cutoff above which uh, 
people wouldn't be uh, allowed to compete in, in uh, women's or girls' sports. There's not really any defensible way to do that uh, based on the data, and it's not defensible for other reasons as well. And the other thing I, I just should just point out quickly, these three are highly plastic within individuals, right? We know that, that obviously our body weights, my body weight fluctuates, uh, uh, estradiol uh, fluctuates in, in females on a monthly cycle, and testosterone, testosterone responds to all kinds of things in the environment. So something to say about that, but I, again, overlap in distributions. If you know the category, uh, male or female in this case, sex at birth, uh, it's hard to predict any individual values. Okay, and again, so here's the, what I just said. Means can differ significantly, but there still can be lots of overlap, so that doesn't give you predictive power. All right, how to handle. I want to try to finish pretty soon here, because you guys have been sitting here. Uh, I'll introduce this, and then, then I'll skip over and let, let uh, Jimmy tell you about it tomorrow afternoon. So we're, we're expanding this correlation database that, that my lab made a while ago. And, and again, so the off diagonal in G are the additive genetic covariances, and correlations are standardized covariances, also problematic. I gave a talk years ago about how I'd been misled by genetic correlations, and so I won't review that part. Uh, and I use the word lame sauce in the title that some people like to remember. Um, so, but n now I want to look at phenotypic uh, correlations, and that's what this database, and this concept of integration. And so Jimmy picked up, uh, there's Jimmy, uh, where we left off in 2014. He's expanding the database. Uh, we really would love data. So if you have measurements on multiple traits uh, within the same population for at least 10 individuals, uh, we'd love to, to hear about that. It's harder than you might think, even with dry and stuff, to get this kind of data, but um, Jimmy's working on it. And tomorrow, 11.45 and 5.24B, uh, it's a cool talk, and I'll skip a lot of this stuff. So here's the data. Maybe I'm just going to zip through this stuff. I'm just going to do this one, because uh, I think Jimmy's not going to focus on this that much. So th this is one, in, in, and it's also in my outline. So the median correlation is similar to the mean correlation about 0.5 across the tree of life. Okay, so we have plants, uh, vertebrates, and invertebrates here, and we split up the vertebrates because uh, we vertebrates are too obsessed with, with vertebrates and we measure them too much. Um, it, so what this means, the R square of 0.25, it means that on average, 75% of the variance in any two traits is independent. So if you know the value of one trait in an individual, you know really not much about the trait in other individuals. I should say each point is a species, and these are mean correlations among all the traits in that species, each point. Um, and for the, the plants, mammals, and birds with the smaller correlations, uh, the R square is less than 10%. So 90% or more of the variation uh, is independent. Again, you can't predict other traits if you know the value of one trait. And there's humans. Um, I can't even see it. Right there, right? That, that whatever that is, reddish. Uh, we're exactly median mammals uh, in this case. Um, and, and for my botanical friends, I've been saying this for some years, Floral traits are not more correlated than vegetative traits. And we meet, well, we know everything but mammals, herps, and invertebrates in particular. Okay, so um, one thing, I, I, I'll, I'll do this. These, the fish and the herps, I think those correlations are actually inflated. I don't think they're that highly correlated. I think it's really just invertebrates that are. Um, and here's, I think that's by indeterminate growth. So let me do my little uh, toy example here. So this correlation is a real correlation, but it's <laughs> between two floral traits and wild radish. I had the data. It has nothing to do with herps or indeterminate growth. Um, and so my idea is that, again, made example, is that I'm saying, let's say we had those high correlations we saw in, in uh, fish and herps. Uh, let's assume that there is no correlation within age cohorts because cohorts, the data we have doesn't have age cohorts. It's just 
you know, fish and herbs. Um, so let's assume there's no correlation. And so I'm going to just draw a circle. So here, here's the, the, jupe, the year one individuals. And I'm just saying, look, there's not really, maybe there is with these points, but again, uh, I'm making this up. But the circle is, is, you know, no, there's no ellipse. It's not a correlation, absolutely no correlation. Um, but as they grow, they're growing in both traits at the same time. Okay. And so this growth in both traits creates this correlation when cohorts are combined. It doesn't really exist at the organismal level. It's just we're, we're gamishing these di different uh, age groups and it's creating an inflated correlation. And this can also happen when differentiated populations are combined as well. So if you have data, age cohort data on a species with indeterminate growth, that would be fabulous. Is this true? I'm making this up. I don't know, but I bet, it's, I bet it could be true. Hmm. You know, I think I'm going to wrap this up. Do I have any way of zooming through slides here? Maybe not. I'm just going to... Look at it. Keep up, keep up. You're learning things sub subliminally. Uh, 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 Jimmy, uh, I, I love this new, new idea. He's using variances and these variances in proportions of traits as really a better me measure of integration. Uh, and I'm super excited about it. So tomorrow, 1145, 524B, I think that's right. So there it is. And here they, whoosh, don't get motion sickness. Yeah, and then I was going to geek out about correlational selection. Uh, oh, there was past, past president, past, past, past president Butch Bodie's classic work on, on, on garter snakes. There's my student Robin Waterman, who did some great work. You missed her talk yesterday. Uh, we don't know much about stabilizing selection. I don't think constraints are that important. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you guys have been here long enough. Okay, so let me let me kind of wrap up um, and, and just go through what I've said. I don't think uh, all traits are genes and environments. Heritability, we've given a lot of too much weight to. Again, VA is fundamental for adaptation and especially to human caused environmental change. Uh, things like global change, global warming, small population conservation, and talked about urbanization. Although surprisingly, right, she said that selection isn't that necessarily super strong in urban environments. And so there, the, the heritability is, is, is not that important. What we've all assumed, and she's mentioned this, that this is a brand new environment. There should be strong selection. And so then, then visa of A is super important, right? How fast can they evolve in response to the strong selection because they've been moved off their optimum uh, sometimes that's going to be important, uh, but I guess not always. Hard to categorize phenotypic variation means can can differ, uh, but but lots of overlap and and also correlations are not strong. So we have very little predictive ability among traits. Um, humans are no exception, um, and I didn't talk about that stuff. Uh, the correlational selection and integration, that's all important. I'm still working on that stuff, but it may not be as important as we thought. I kind of already said this. So instead of categorizing, we need to quantify means, variances, and covariances. The G matrix within population only predicts response to current or future selection. That's important, but that's all it does. Um, and mean differentiation among populations in a common environment is the result of past evolution. Okay, so that's another distinction, the variation within, that's for future evolution. Uh, differentiation among populations or species is due to past evolution. And it, I sometimes see, see these a little bit conflated in the literature. Okay, uh, acknowledgement. I wanna thank the Evolutionary Processes panel uh, for funding most of the work that I skipped over in this talk. <laughs> Um, and I really want to uh, uh, send a shout out to Sam Shiner. Uh, Sam is retiring at the end of this year after 26 years at that panel. He was there before the panel was called Evolutionary Processes. I've known him since before that. He's handled a number of my grants. He's been a, a super good advocate within the agency for our fields and new initiatives in, at NSF. Uh, he's continued a research program, continued to publish, which is mind-boggling to me given uh, what program officers have to do. But then I really want to highlight his involvement in our societies. 
He's almost always at these meetings. He's almost always at the ecology meetings. And he serves on committees. He does lots of work for our societies. Um, so I want to say, Sam, can you stand up? There are a lot of good program officers that will, can try to take up the slack. Um, and here's some collaborators that I just wanted to quickly uh, point out. And, and then I, I just want here's my lab. And I, I just want to reiterate um, David on, on Saturday uh, talked about, as a white male, uh, the privileges he's had and, and the responsibility to create, uh, to train a more diverse set of people than... <laughs> than he was or his, his mentors. And I, I felt the same thing. And, and it's been difficult for me, I, I have to say. So it, for many years, I tried to diversify my lab. And then finally, Jimmy, who may be my last student two years ago, I finally recruited a male PhD student. So I was pretty. <laughs> if you work on plant evolution, it's super easy to get, uh, get women in your lab. No, but I also would try to diversify other ways, and it didn't work. I was particularly working on people of color. And then uh, 20 years ago, I learned to, to partner with HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. So I'd have fact, uh, there was a faculty member at Jackson State and another one at North Carolina A&T, and, and they would send me their students, and, and that worked great. And, and I think we've also, um, I think my lab is also pretty uh, considered a good space for LGBTQ folks. So um, uh, that makes me happy. Uh, and there, there's my current lab. Oh, and there, there's REUs here. There's uh, undergraduates, uh, RETs. I've had a lot of teachers in the lab. Again, funded by evolutionary processes. Um, so that's another kind of uh, aspect of, of diversity that I, I try to foster in the lab. And people really work together in teams and help each other out. OK, and there's my contact information again. And that's more than enough out of me. So I, again, I thank you for coming. And I'd be, I'd be happy to answer questions, the, the mics. Oh, God. Question. I'm doomed. I've known Linda forever. Yes. So like you, I've been interested in phenotypic variation my whole life. I've been interested in correlations for at least half of it. If you go into a single population, which is important because that's where evolution happens, right? Within a population. And you look at trait correlations, you think, well, they tell you something. I think they tell you something. And then you do artificial selection and you, you see that you get correlated responses to selection on a single trait. And then you go to the among population level and you go, oh my goodness, look, these correlations hold up at the among population level too. And then you go to closely related species and you see that they hold up. So maybe correlations don't matter, but nature seems to think they do. So I didn't say they didn't matter. Um, and and you're, ca oh, she's leaving. Um, uh, so, so partly what Linda's talking about, I, I would categorize as Dolph Schluter's evolution along lines of least resistance, um, where we see divergence uh, among populations and species that, that matches the directions of correlations within species. And that's right. And there's some recent examples of the science paper just a couple of months ago suggesting this is true. Um, I don't think that that proves that the correlations are guiding. It may be, and again, I still think correlations are matter, matter and I didn't talk about the ways I think they're, uh, I didn't really talk about the ways I think were less, less important, other than they don't help us predict traits uh, in, in individuals. But if you look at the examples of lines of least resistance, um, well, I haven't done this in a while, but I did this a few years ago. One of them from my lab. You, 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 do, you definitely see that. You, you see that, that most species are, are along that line, but some species break free. 
Um, and Linda, of course, did an experiment where, and I did experiments, and other people have done experiments, they, they, they went by fast, where you can select a, a, a perpendicular to the major axis of a correlation and get rapid evolution. And so um, another interpretation is that that, that line of least resistance is actually some adaptive uh, axis, and, and, and uh, when selection wants to take a species out of that axis, uh, it can do it. So there's Dr. Pangloss again. I think it's probably both. I mean, I think, there, I think the evidence is accumulating enough that, that Linda is right, that there is some bias in evolution, especially on shorter time scales, but we've got some examples on longer time scales. And again, I didn't say correlations weren't important. I'm just saying we, we assign too much importance in, in other ways th than that, and I, I didn't really talk about that part. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, yeah, so a, a lot of quantitative genetic breeding designs can't partition variants into the interactive, uh, like epistatic variants and dominance variants that were also on the denominator there. And so I wonder uh, what you think about how that affects the conclusions for the relative role of uh, environmental variants and, you know, distorting estimates of VA and heritabilities and things like that. So it'll, it'll just Distort the heritability, not necessarily the V sub A, because those so, designs so, can, can cleanly separate V A. But but you're right, the the dominance. Because I think that variance ends up in V E when you don't model it. So, that epistatic and dominance variance ends up in V E. Well, I mean, you're you're right that they don't they don't separate dominance and epistatic variance from V sub E. Um, it's not that they're being well; they're sort of being one together. Um, yeah, that's an issue. Uh, and I haven't looked at this literature in a long time, but, but I know there are a number of people that, I, I think the evidence is still that those are smaller in natural populations, the V sub D and V sub I, even though epistasis and dominance are ubiquitous, that gene action at the level of pairs uh, of, of uh, genes. One way to think about this is for epistasis is that the epistatic variance is that if one of the two epistatic, uh, inter, inter, epistatically interacting loci is fixed, then now there's no variance in that population uh, contributed. It, it, there is no variance contributed. So I, I think that's the argument. Um, I'll just tell my little story about, I was at a, a, a workshop one time where we talked about a lot of this stuff and there were a group of people that were very interested in epistatic variants and, and uh, I'll, I'll call them out by name. So Russ Landy, he got a little upset and said, you guys are always on about epistasis and it's not, it doesn't, it's not an important contributor to variants in population. So that, that's Russ's view uh, and, and maybe the literature doesn't support that as well as it, it used to. I, I don't know, I haven't reviewed that, but. Thanks. Sure. It would be cool if we could separate all that stuff better. Hey, um, fantastic talk. Um, so I'm very excited about uh, hearing about the variation of heritability across space and time because I've been thinking about this um, recently a lot. So I'm also interested in predicting evolution. So what do you think of this variation of heritability across time and space could affect our ability to predict evolution? Um, I think Linda just said that evolution happens uh, within populations, right? And that's, that's a true statement. Although <laughs> even populations sometimes can be hard to define because we're categorizing continuous variation, especially in some species. But, but, but that's true. And so uh, th that's where our predictions can be made. Um, uh, and so as long as you are predicting evolution in the population that you are measuring selection and, and measuring the G matrix, uh, that should be good. Now, having said that, you know, what Linda said about some of this stuff scales up across species, you know, maybe that suggests that, the, that that variation isn't as important as I think it is. I, I, I'm not sure. I'm just thinking about that, that right now. But um, so... It's sort of a problem, I think, for our sciences, that for evolution, is that it, evolution does happen within populations and we can't study all the populations. Yeah, but what if heritability also varied across time point? Then, like, even if you're making predictions within a same population, 
you know, you'll probably not be accurate. So, so there's a pretty big literature, uh, some people in this room I think may have contributed to it, from, oh boy, 15 some years ago about the stability of the G matrix. How much does the G matrix of the additive variances and covariances, how, much, uh, how stable is that over time within and among species? And, and uh, I think pretty much the upshot, maybe more than 15 years ago, uh, the upshot that I recall, not having looked at that literature in a long time, is that it's, the G matrix is fairly stable uh, over short evolutionary timescales. So again, maybe this says my emphasis on population specificity isn't as important as I'm, as I'm saying. Um, the G matrix is fairly stable within species and among closely related species, but then the further out in phylogenetic space you get, the, the less stable it is. I think that's a fair characterization, um, if that helps. Cool. All right. We think we're supposed to get out of here pretty soon anyway. So again, thanks so much.